they're interviewing for a three and a half inch sprite and no bigger than your hand and uh, who uh, doesn't talk. And I said, well, you know, I mean, come on, I, I'm working here at 20th Century. I'm lucky to be working. Well, she said it was at Disney. I said, I'll be there at 6 a.m. in the morning. Welcome, friends, fans, and children of all ages to another episode of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today, we are going back to the Great Forest by way of the second star to the right with two amazing guests. So without further ado, let us wish upon a star and bring them out. Our first guest appeared in several films as a child actor, and today he joins us as the voice of the Prince of the Forest himself, Bambi. Please welcome Donnie Dunnigan. Hi. Hey, hey. I'm sorry to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here, sir. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, to our audience, I, I feel, I, I first off, right out of the guest, I just want to say um, thank you very much, sir, for your service to the United States Marine Corps. Uh, on behalf of myself and, and GalaxyCon.com, I uh, thank you for uh, for what you've done for our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You second. To, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Marine Corps veteran, uh, retiring at the rank of major with a bronze star. Is that correct? That's right. And some other stuff. That's yeah. A my body God didn't put there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. My, my father was a purple heart recipient as well, but he had only one and I believe you had three. Absolutely. Again, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you for all the work, work that you've done for us. Thank you. And now, uh, before we get into the Disney stuff and bring in our other guest, I want to go across to town to Universal Studios, where you appeared in the classic film The Son of Frankenstein with an amazing cast, Basil Rathbone, Lionel Atwill, and of course, Boris Karloff's final appearance as Frankenstein's monster. That was a joy. That was my second film. <clears throat> the real secret to that for me, and there was a lot of scenes in there, that film, yeah. Trying to look afraid of Frankenstein. Boris Karloff, Frankenstein, he could have been a stand up comic. When we weren't on camera, he was a joy. <laughs> he was always teasing me about something. And all of a sudden, now we're in a scene where I'm supposed to look afraid. I had a hard time doing that. <laughs> so I, the children often would say, Oh, particularly in the scene where he had his foot on me by the pit, weren't you yeah. afraid? Weren't you afraid? It took a long time to make that scene because Rosalind B. Lee, the director, was a genius for the shadows, way ahead of his time. Yeah. But in that position, me on the ground like this, Frankenstein standing there with his foot on me or by me, you know, for many, many minutes. He got bored. Remember now, Boris Koloff could have been a stand up comic, great guy, okay? Yeah. He got bored. I'm bored, okay, laying there like a little dove, right? He knew that I was ticklish. You learn that from my mom or somebody, and he hmm. took his boot. You, by me, not on me. Okay, right. I'm sort of rubbing the side of my my uh, my body. And I'm laying. I'm sort of laughing, pretty laugh, laughing like a kid does, right? <laughs> and then the cameraman started laughing. Everybody said, "Roland B. Lee, gentleman director, said take a break." We did ten minutes. Come back, same position by the pit. I'm like this. Boris has got his foot there. He did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Roland B. Lee, who was a real classic man, said, I never heard him be harsh before. That is enough. Cut. <laughs> and we took another break, came back, and I got scolded by somebody, probably my mother. Look afraid, look afraid. So when children look at that scene and say, gosh, why weren't you afraid? Afraid nothing. I had a hard time looking that way. <laughs> Well, again, it's 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 a really remarkable film. Uh, many people consider it to be. Uh, there were more Frankenstein films, obviously, but everybody considers the Frankenstein to be a trilogy. Frankenstein, Pride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein. So, uh, again, absolute classic. And again, that cast, yeah, again, Basil Rathbone. The relationship between your character and Lionel Atwill is uh, was really charming. <clears throat> Remember Bella Lugosi. Yes. Classic, classic performer, right? An unrecognizable in that 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 makeup. Yeah. Well, early on, he was always late. Early on, we're all assembled. Basil Rathbone, who could have been the Brit uh, British Prime Minister, you know? Yeah. 
And Boris Karloff was, was, was cracking up everybody with was jokes he stole from somebody. We're all standing there, my mom, Roland Billy. Here comes, now, my mom had just coached me. to try at my second film, out of, the, out of the Depression, we were dirt poor before, right? Mm -hmm. She's trying to coach me to be a little gentleman. I am I'm barely five years old, right? And she she coached me how to introduce and how to say sir for change, done again. <laughs> and and I heard uh, Mr. Bella Lagosi's name the day before. Mm -hmm. Here he comes. We're all standing there getting ready. And he's late. He's walking up. <clears throat> this um, um, probably could have got me fired. <laughs> In my childhood voice, like a young girl instructor. Everybody, look, here comes Mr. Belly Goosey. <laughs> he didn't talk to me for seven or eight weeks while we were in that production. And what, what made it worse, Boris Karloff picked up on that. And every once in a while, Boris would yell across the, the soundstage off camera and say, Hey, Belly, how's your day? <laughs> <laughs> <Here's the movie. laughs> That's wonderful. Oh my goodness. Uh, that that is fantastic. Uh, man, if we ever have you back, I, I would love to go on to more of this. But we have an amazing young lady uh, waiting in the wings, our next guest. And let's go ahead and bring her out. She is another child performer and a radio broadcaster. She joins us today as a live action model of Tinkerbell in Peter Pan. Please welcome Margaret Carey. Oh, it's good to be here. It really, really is. I'm looking at you at all, all these little squares that are bouncing around, and I must be in the 20 or 21st century, I think. Right? <laughs> yes, you are. You are correct. We are in the 21st. Sometimes I forget it myself. There you go. This is great. This is really, really great. Oh, um, I haven't. I'm not very good electronically, but everybody is helping me here. So if I do anything that is embarrassing, just don't let me know. <laughs> no problem whatsoever. So uh, before we get to your Disney stuff, I would love to talk a little bit about uh, some of your other things. Uh, you, of course, you began uh, your first movie was the uh, original uh, film adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which yes, is still very, still a still a beautiful film. Still holds oh, up remarkably oh, well yeah. even to this day. And a lot of people understood Shakespeare after they finished that film. I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly did. And then afterwards, you did some work on The Little Rascals. Yes, that was great fun. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I called myself the blur because they would say, um, Peggy, it was Peggy Lynch at the time. Was my, uh, Eddie Cantor changed my name to Margaret Carey later on. But mm -hmm. it was Peggy Lynch that said, Peggy, run over there and smile. Now cross there and run over and look sad. And then go sit down and be quiet. And then stand up and cheer. And everything that they told me, I did. But I had no idea what was going on. I was four years old at the time. But it was it was scary and exciting at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that you did later on in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, uh, you provided uh, the voice of several characters on two uh, uh, series that I'm a fan of, Clutch Cargo and Space Angel, who are very famous for their unique approach to uh, voicing the characters. And I could try to explain it to our audiences unaware of it, but instead... We have a clip, and I'm going to ask if our producer is ready to roll it. Let's see if we can get this up. Here we go. 35 miles directly west of this point is where we'll find the plane. Was the plane on a mission? And that's you, correct? <laughs> that's me. That's you. <laughs> all right, all right, we get the idea. Okay, so this was the idea of these shows. They were they were animated in a, uh, we'll say, an inexpensive manner, and they created this process. Now, was were those your lips? That, those that, were my lips and my pink tongue. And <laughs> But we could, uh, we were in deficit because we were a small outfit and so we couldn't come against Hanna Barbera or MGM or any of those so we had to pay for it up front and no episode which was about four minutes long could cost over three thousand six hundred and sixty six dollars which was a lot of money back then <laughs> but, but here's the interesting thing about it clutch cargo changed the whole direction of morning TV cartoons the whole direction Everything before that was squashed cats or dogs that blew up or birds, that, you know, whatever it was. And my husband, Dick Brown, who produced it, 
said, we've got to have some adventures. And so yeah. they changed it with um, uh, Clark Haas, who did uh, cartoons for uh, several car uh, adventure cartoons. And they changed it to uh, adventure, a crazy adventure. And so yeah. there were people, there were actual people in it before there was always a kitty cat or, or something or other. Uh -huh. And it made all the difference in the world. And uh, if you look closely, you're going to have to remind me of the man's name, but the one that did all the adventures uh, looking for the lost ark, what is oh, this? Indiana Jones. Yes, Indiana Jones. If you look closely, he looks like Indiana Jones. This was before anything happened like that. And there is a book out, by the way, that was written by a fellow named Collier, and you can get it on Amazon. It's called Clutch Cargo and His Adventure Log. And it shows how we did it, and it was very oh, wow. complicated, as a matter of fact. So I did Spinner. Let me do it for you. Gee, Clutch, what do we do now? And I was a old boy who traveled with him, and we never explained that. <laughs> That's true. That's absolutely true. Uh... Oh yeah, clutch car goes up at your lot. Okay, all right. But, yeah, that, I I I man, I was unaware of that. I have to check it out myself. The thing, and you're absolutely right, though. Uh, it did set a new standard. That yes, it didn't have to be squished cats or the funny animals. Uh, they were simple stories, but they were good stories. Space Angel as well, especially with yeah. all the the designs by the great cartoonist Alex Toth. Yes, uh, just 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 knocked it out of the park and. It's 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 kind of interesting. It, among connoisseurs, they're still extremely well regarded, but again, it's just one of those things that's that's falling beneath the cracks. And I'm waiting for somebody to, to lead a renaissance. Uh, we had to sell every um, station one by one by one by one, mm -hmm. so it was not a syndicate that picked it up. And the first one was Kalispell, Montana, very close to my heart because they started this with enough money to keep going. Wow, absolutely. And the rest is history. And speaking of history, uh, let's go to higher end uh, animation in the form of the Disney outfit and uh, our, our topic uh, topic of tonight. And uh, if we go in chronological order, I'll just ask you both this. First of all, both of you, welcome to the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Um, we're looking forward to the day when the world gets a little bit back to normal and we can once again bring you back to our physical stages and get you back in front of your fans. But in the meantime, we have this electronic format. We're so glad to have you both here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Absolutely. You. So our team right now is going through our chat room and they're going to pull out the audience questions for us. In the meantime, I would just love to hear for every certification and uh, who may not know it at this point, I'd love to hear how your signature roles at Disney evolved. And if we go chronologically, Donnie, this would go with you first. Um, how did Bambi begin for you? <laughs> it wasn't with the magic glass like this, I promise you, okay? Right. <laughs> I, I had uh, six or seven films as a child, little runt kid with all that curly hair, huh? a couple of them in co-star, but in six or seven films already. <clears throat> and we're at home. I think it's a Saturday morning. Um, this is 80 years ago, eight zero ah, years ago. <laughs> and uh, Walt Disney called the house to talk to my mother. <clears throat> now, unlike this wonderful magic glass we're doing here, huh? <clears throat> the phone and those state of the art, mind you, okay, was like a big cardboard box, wood, on the wall in the kitchen. Okay? And you had a little tube that you talked into, and the hits was like this. Yeah, oh, you know what? Remember those? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You're too young. Come on. <laughs> no, I, no, believe it or not, I'm not. I I do I do remember I do remember those. <laughs> and he called and and uh, the Disney folks know this, and I don't want to be fibbing about anything. The honesty is we didn't know Disney for nothing except cartoons. Okay, we barely understood the name, but at that moment, he called courteous man to call my mother personally, and she talked to him for a couple minutes. She yelled at me in another other room, and, and this is very close to her bedroom. Um, at least it's a good paraphrase. She said something like, "Donnie, Johnny." <clears throat> The movie man that makes the cartoons wants to talk to you. Wow. <laughs> now I'm in the other room bored. We didn't have television. You stare at the radio, right? Because you're bored, right? I come running to the kitchen. She put the little stool down so I could stand up with the darn cell phone. And uh, she said, it's, his name is Disney. It's Mr. Disney. At least I knew that much. Duh. Okay. 
Hello, sir, Mr. Disney. Nice man on the phone. And, and I have no precise memory of this, except he said something about you know, a regular movie, not a cartoon, and we want you to be a, a part of it. And do you think you'd be interested in doing that with, with Disney company? And I said something very clever, like, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> I didn't know anything about anything. <laughs> I gave the phone back to my mother. She listened to him for a couple of minutes. She got really excited about it. I made some agreement about me going to his studio, which was in a new one at that time, I understand, in Burbank, new buildings, which we did a couple of days later. She put the phone down, thought for a moment, then she called our manager. You had to have a manager in those days, the other manager. <clears throat> um, I think in my second movie, Boris called for somebody recommended my mother get a manager, so she had this guy. Right? <clears throat> he always wore a bow tie and he, kind of a pompous fellow, my thought. And uh, I had seen a lot of gentlemen now th at this point, five or six movies, you know, Basil Rathbone and some great people. And uh, this guy was a real contrast, right? this manager. So we come to the house like a rocket and sit in the living room with my mom and, and me. And, and my mom gave him a, a digest of what Mr. Disney had said. Oh, here's my manager. Oh, you can't do that. Where I spoil his career. And then he said the wrong thing to my mom. Right? Now, I'm only five years old. I boxed for many years later. It's a good thing I didn't box then, okay? Mm. <laughs> I'm the boss. I, he's going to do what I want to do. <laughs> I, I couldn't help. Now, mind you, I'm five and a half, maybe going on 15 up here a little bit. Okay? Yep. Seen some stuff, right? I got up, went right in front of him. This story was told by other people, maybe too much. Right in front of him, I said, you're fired. Go away. Quote, the quote, no digest, no fancy document. You're fired. Go away. Oh, he went bananas. I mean, told me, mother, quick, this kid. Rah, 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 rah. My mother finally supported me. He says, I think you need to do what Donnie said. You're fired. Go away. Oh, he got up, laid rubber in the driveway with his fancy car. Bam, he's gone, right? Two or three days, maybe a bit more later, we went to the Disney studio in Burbank, okay, uh, from near UCLA. No freeways in those days. Mm -hmm. the boulevards were not like we have now. Yeah. And on this one, I know you're too young to remember this. Okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it took forever to get there. Huh? We had a lot of, the stop signs were real stop signs. You know, ding, ding, stop, ding, ding, go. It took a lot of time to get there. Mr. Disney was just wonderful. Uh, he had been working with some of the artists. He had his sleeves rolled up. He wasn't like a pompous executive. He was a real, I learned later, many observations, a leader by example. And he yeah. participated in things, you know, yeah. and um, the, everybody loved him. The, the, the janitors, everybody. Anyway, just our first meeting, several people in the room. Um, I learned later one of them was a, 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 a major artist in Bambi, but I didn't know anything. I'm at the place where they make all these wonderful characters, right? I'm all excited. Somebody told him, or he knew before, that I fired this guy. He knew something about this manager. He was thrilled. He broke out laughing. Everybody broke out laughing. I could have been a, a jerk and got the job because I fired that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's in totally in line with what I have always understood about Walt Disney. He uh, he admired gumption. He admired ingenuity, and he was somebody that went he what he wanted something. He went after it, and that's the type of people he wanted working with him. And it's a miracle I didn't get. My mother was always worried about am I being fired? Uh, and I was like, boy, I was like, what's a good point? But we out of the depression, she's always fearful going back into the depression. And uh, yeah. I can do any little thing. And oh my gosh, you might, we might get fired. That's where I got that word fired from, by the way. Yeah. There's a couple of times in just when the, when the format uh, um, allows it, uh, I'll share with the three of you and the 95 of you. Uh, a <laughs> couple of times in Disney where I almost got fired. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh my oh my so we have, uh we have a picture of uh some person stuff of when you're when you're working on bambi let's go ahead and roll that one from my guy i should should give him a heads up yeah, yeah. that's you and you in the upper left hand corner look at that <laughs> uh look at that look at that yeah it was like you're, you looked like you were, you were getting taller, but your hair was getting smaller. Because <laughs> you, you had that big curly mop and the uh, <laughs> Frankenstein. Yeah. They, uh, that had to be about a year or a year and a half 
after, after the, the, the first meeting in the studio. Now, I grew up very fast there. And oh, and they allowed me to get rid of that curly hair. She had to curl that twice a day. What a bummer. And oh, boy, shortcut. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. And let's jump ahead. Uh, Margaret, um, yes. how how did Peter Pan uh, begin for you? Because you had a very unique role as 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 the as the model for Trinkerbell. Well, let me go back and 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 remark on what um, was just said. Uh, when I was going, I tell people that I was born in 1929 and I caused the Depression. <laughs> Everything was right downhill from there. And so you could make $6.50 to $8.50 from working in the movies. So money was important uh, of the yes. things that were going on. In the meantime, my mother started training me as a dancer. And mm. I was a pretty doggone good dancer. I was a solo soloist dancer. So um, I was working. I had done 172 television show for ABC on the Ruggles show with Charlie Ruggles. And out of that, I was hired to be an assistant dance director at 20th Century Fox. I was out there working and I was about, oh, 19, 20, something like that. I've never stopped to figure it out because I'm not good at math. So whatever I say, it won't be correct. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, I got a call from my agent who said, could you get off work from the, from the movie tomorrow and at, at, at 20th Century? And they said, uh, uh, they're, they're interviewing for a three and a half inch Sprite and no bigger than your hand and uh, who uh, doesn't talk. And I said, well, you know, I mean, come on. I, I'm working here at 20th Century. I'm lucky to be working. Well, she said it was at Disney. I said, I'll be there at 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. and that's the way everybody felt. They really, really did. So the next day I went, uh, well, that night I, I put together on a, a little 45 record, the ones with the big holes, you know, yeah. a little bit, a, um, pantomime of a little boy fixing breakfast for himself. I wasn't going to go without none. I had been working in the movies all this time. So yeah. I knew I had to bring something. So the man knew my name on the uh, on the, his, his board. I was so excited. He showed me where to park the car. I was so excited. And I got out and immediately got lost. And that's <laughs> not easy to do to get lost on the small Disney studio lot. I anyway, believe it. Along came a man, a tall, gangly man. He said, you look lost. And I said, uh-huh, I'm waiting to look for Mark Davis, and I don't know where he is. He says, I'll take you. And I was stunned. I had never been on a, a studio lot before when anybody would have helped you. And anybody, wow. most any place, they just would have walked on. But he took me up to the third floor in the animation building, which doesn't look like a rehearsal hall because it's not. <clears throat> and he said, there, that door, and there's Mark Davis. And I walked in, my little player, my 45 player, and of course my sheets that tell my background. And he, he sat in this crowded room, and there on the wall, there on the wall with large white sheets, he had sketched this fabulous little fairy. And of course, mm -hmm. I wanted to look at him, and he, you know, he wanted to talk to me. So he said, what's that? I said, I told him. And so I did the Panama. And he said, I'm going to call Jerry Geronimi, who is one of the over directors of the film. And I want, want him to see you. So he came, came to the office. And then they did the scene. And they said, we want her to look down on a mirror and, and look at herself and be very happy with herself, except she finally gets to her hips and they're too large. And she steps <laughs> off. Can you do that? I was 20. I could do anything. So, <laughs> and I said, of course I can. And I played this little fairy as if she were about, oh, nine years old. I figured she had never seen a mirror before. So when you oh. see the movie, and I assume that other people have seen, seen uh, Peter Pan, you will see me looking down, not that I'm preening myself, but, oh, is that what I look like? Oh, really? Oh, my. Oh, hmm size of my head and marched off. And I I had no I I that's 
that's that changes uh, so much. Uh, that one uh, that's such a definitive scene for that character. And looking back on it, that makes that's a beautiful interpretation. It does. Yeah. The biggest thing was, you know, many people, Marilyn Monroe was the model for people. And intuitively, that sounds rough. But the reason that I worked with it, if you go back and watch it, Tinkerbell's walk is the dancers. Everything that she does yes. is the dancers. <clears throat> And Marilyn was not a dancer at the time. I thought Marilyn could do anything. And she was also in the contract to 20th Century Fox. Yes. So they were not going to let her go to do that. She was wonderful. I worked with her. And I, I think she's incredible. So <clears throat> when I when they called me up and they said, would it be convenient to come to, to work next Tuesday? I was stunned. Nobody had ever asked me whether it would be convenient to come to work. So I said, well, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. All right, okay. I can do that. Then we said, what time? And I went, oh, um, 10 o'clock. They said, fine, be at the hairdressers and get your hair done up for Tinkerbell, wear your one piece bathing suit, and we'll meet you at sound stage one. And the first time that I stepped out in front of the camera, I looked at uh, Mark Davis, who was sitting there with all the sketches in front of him, what they wanted. I said, Mr. Davis, now, that's how long ago it was, 68 years, I think. Wow. Uh, I looked at him and I said, Mr. Davis, do you want it to be ditzy like Betty Blue? Do you want it to be above it all like uh, Queen of the Fairies? He said, Margaret, he said very quietly, Margaret, we want her to be you. And I said, gosh, golly, I think I could do that. So they gave me carte blanche to do yeah. what I thought she would do. And I'm one of those people who, again, wants to know the adventure around the corner, what's happening. I'm so curious. And that was Tinkerbell. And so we would work out the scenes. I would hit my mark. We would roll the, the camera twice for protection. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go home. And wow. that's when I became Tinkerbell. That is remarkable. I, I'm still reeling at the concept of, yeah, she was unaware of her reflection and that changes it up. And it, it's so interesting because that's such an iconic uh, character that was re-embraced about, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, a new generation of teenage girls uh, re-embraced Tinkerbell for her, the sassiness and, and the energy and uh, yeah. May I, may I say something right about this? This is a book that uh, I signed for people, and it's the unabridged uh, James M. Berry story of Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm out there urging everybody to read it because it's almost like a whole new thing to them. They don't know about the Lost Boys. They don't know about Mrs. Darling. They don't know that Tinkerbell is not in love with Peter Pan. She never was. Uh, they yes. don't know that, that Peter was never in love with Wendy uh, no. and the adventures that were there. So this is the one, one and it, it's a great book and it's like the original. And it even has even the uh, engravings. Oh, in, that's wonderful. Lovely. So <clears throat> I'm urging everybody to get it in your libraries. You could get it on Amazon. You could get it from me on my website. But please, what it? it's like, did you know that Wendy grew up? Yes. Did you know the story is in there of Wendy growing up and Peter coming back for Wendy to take her to Neverland? No, it's in here. Mm -hmm. And the darling lived in a kennel. Did you know that? He was so upset. And uh, 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 Tinkerbell's name for Wendy was translated into horse's ass, I believe? No, it was it was uh, uh, jackass. Jackass. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> close to it. Close to it. Yeah. She would make the noise. And yeah. It's like well, it's fairy for jackass. So anyway, I guess I'm on a campaign because people call me and say, I never knew that. I never knew why the, you know, I'm a, I'm the redheaded mermaid in the movie also. Oh. It's over for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Davis gave me that little tour, which was nice. And why are they so unhappy? It says so in here. So I'm urging anybody to get the unabridged James M. Berry book, which was written six years after he did the play, which is another story in itself. And yeah. it's like you're finding about all over again. Donnie, you were showing off. You have a copy of uh, Bambi offhand, uh, uh, early first edition. Right 
Ta da! Wow, look at that. Get rid of <laughs> One of the interesting things about this book, okay, is that I just had no clue what the storyline was, okay? And uh, on other films, even as a, as a child, I was reading paper, newspapers reasonably well at page five. I always wanted to know what the storyline was. And most of the time, somebody, a script girl, assistant director, my mom, somebody would tell me, this story is about this, about that, right? I'm at wonderful New Disney with courteous, wonderful people for weeks and weeks and weeks doing facial work with the artist, look left, look right, because how did you yeah. do the facial model before the yeah. point, right? And I must have pestered everybody to death about what's the storyline? What's the storyline? Finally, a nice lady you showed a little uh, uh, clip of that a few months ago. A nice lady uh, got a couple of us together that I had not seen another child. And now I was going to hear another child. Oh my gosh, who's this? That's how strange this was. And a nice lady uh, with a book, uh, an original like this, I suspect, um, I gave us some idea what the storyline was. <clears throat> but I had not seen a deer. Now, this is really important. I'm supposed to be a deer in a story that I don't know anything about. You know, and I see it. We came out of the Depression where a hamburger a week was a big deal. Okay? And now we're in a little house and we're going three meals a day. And my, my parents are now relaxed and my dad's working. The Depression is still on. This is before Pearl Harbor. Okay? And I, I'm pestering nice folks at Disney. I'm sure I'm pestering. My mom told me I was about. What's a deer? Where's the deer? What's the deer? They somebody showed me a little black and white sketch of one. I said, okay, that's a deer. <laughs> Mr. Disney or somebody heard about this and decided to send me to the zoo. And so a couple of nice Disney uh, men, well dressed in a big car with a hood about the size of a football field, and my mom, and we went to the local zoo, which I think is Griffith Griffith Park. Yeah. Griffith Park. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. yeah. And it was an immaculate place, very few people there. Um, well done. Uh, they, uh, they had an escort for, uh, for us. And um, we go in and we see some animals. I'm absolutely enchanted by this place. We finally get to a pit, immaculate pit, where there's one deer. <laughs> right in the little pit, just a few feet away. We're elevated with a little fence. And oh boy. And I started yelling at the deer nicely. Here's the deer. Not moving. Huh? I moved around the fence, tried to get in, in, in the facial angle. Hey, deer, 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 you know. Here's the deer. Frozen. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a statue. One of the nice men from uh, from Disney, um, there was a little machine there where he put some coins in and got cor uh, corn, I think it was. Give yeah, me yeah. a bunch of it, right? So I went back to the very best position, pretend like I'm a football player early, threw the corn down, landed right in front of this, this deer. Right? Here's the deer, right? All this corn, watch. <laughs> I, I, That's it. I, little things are so strange. Those little things that go by. <laughs> I remember it so well, don't you, Donnie? Yeah. Just, you remember this, those things. You can't let them go. Yeah. This guy didn't move. Didn't go for the corn. Didn't do nothing, right? Yeah. It's, You're almost fired. Number one, my Disney, right? I said to my mom. Now, mind you, I've been in six or seven films. Little dynamic, fun stuff, right? And is this animated? I still don't understand that, right? Mm -hmm. and I turned my mom with these two Disney guys standing there. I said, Mom, that's a deer? She said, yes, that's a deer. Mom, he's boring. I don't want to be a deer. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're back at Disney, right? The next day, okay, I'm in the hallway, beautiful new building. I'm at the water fountain. And here comes Mr. Disney down the hallway. Um, with some papers and things, and a nice man, well dressed. He comes up, and I'm getting ready to leave the water fountain, and he puts his hand up. He was always very gentle and courteous, and he had a wonderful smile most of the time. He put his hands up to me like this. He says, Johnny, did you enjoy your trip to the, to the zoo? Because he set it up, right? Oh, sure, it was terrific. Johnny, did you, you saw the deer? Yes, sir. And he leaned over at me nicely and said, Johnny, don't worry. Our Bambi will not be boring. <laughs> <laughs> and then we walk off, and I think, ah, I, they ratted me out. <laughs> My mom hears about this on history. <laughs> she never heard about it. 
She never heard about it. And uh, in fact, that was the, the day, next day is when they took my water gun away from you. I got away with, I got away with a whole bunch of stuff there. <laughs> Well, he was right. Bambi was not boring. And Peter Pan, of course, was absolutely miraculous. And uh, bo both of these both of these films have absolutely stood the test of time. Um, which I know is curious because I know Bambi didn't quite go up to expectations on its initial release. But I think on its second release and later on, it, it, it earned its benchmarks. So and, and, and thank you both so much for, for your contributions to it. I mean, it really is. As a fan of animation, as a fan of Disney, and just a fan of good acting uh, in general. I, I thank you both. So absolutely. And we have questions from our audience. Good to go. So let's go ahead and roll the first one. And this comes from Sarah, who would like to know who is your inspiration? Which one of us? For, yeah, for, uh, yeah, for both of you. So for whoever wants to go first. Who's my inspiration? Mm. Sylvia Sidney. Okay, go figure that. No, Sylvia Sidney was a star in the early, I think, Paramount. And because as a child, I looked so much like her. Everybody kept saying, well, you're going to play her daughter, aren't you? Aren't you going? I had no idea who she was. And one day I saw her in a movie and didn't know it was Sylvia Sidney. And I thought, what a great actress. And they thought that I could play her daughter. That took me through 10 years of feeling like I couldn't make anything and act in anything in movies. Oh, wow. So that's Sylvia there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She is. Yes. I can, I, I can see that. All right. Very good. Donnie, how about you? Who was uh, your inspiration? I have so many. It's, uh, I'm sorting this out like a machine gun up here. I have so <laughs> many. I, I need to go back that age, I can tell you. Boris Karloff. Wow. Boris Karloff, because he didn't take himself serious. See, there's a lot of people in the theater, in the movies then, oh boy, I'm a movie star, oh my, oh my, okay? Boris Karloff was discovered, I heard soon then, uh, driving a Max truck in Los Angeles, delivering stuff when he was discovered. And he was a, a, a guy, you know? Yeah. He stayed that way. And off camera, he was the most gentle, fun guy, never took himself seriously. The, the grippers, those big guys that move the stages around, right? yeah. they brought the world to him. And <clears throat> he taught me how to play checkers. Between, we had a lot of time between sets because the sets, remember, dear lady, they were big, heavy thing, real wood. <laughs> it took yeah. a long time to the scene. And Transylvania Castle. Okay? <laughs> it took a long time because we had a lot of break time. I had a little chair with my name on it. Horse call sitting over here, script wars here. He told me how to play checkers. I realized real quickly, hey, he was a good coach. And after four or five games, over a couple of days, he got distracted because the grippers were teasing him about things. He was that kind of wonderful, down to earth guy, not a fine, a big movie star guy, right? Yeah. We're playing checkers. I heard the grippers uh, betting. Now, remember, a nickel was a big money in those days, a quarter, two bets, woo! Huh? That was a day's wages, you know? Yeah. I heard, I heard that in my head. And so I said, I said, Mr. Karloff, I, I'll bet you a quarter on a checker game. Now the grippers are teasing him, so he got distracted. I beat him. I had him locked up. Hey? I knew it too, see? And, and people came around, the director came around all teasing him. I that kid beat you, daddy beat you. You know, Karloff was wonderful. He got up, went into character. I want my quarter. I got my hand on all the grippers. I said, pay the kid, pay the kid. Don't be a stench, whatever they call it, Mosey, skin flint or something, right? Skin flint, yeah. He took me by the hand. If I had a photograph of this, I could pay my mortgage off. He took me by the hand in costume. Everybody's following us, <laughs> teasing him without mercy to his dressing room, which was a, a small trailer inside the, uh, the sound studio. And he went up in the trailer. We're all standing outside. I'm standing waiting for my quarter. I'm serious about this quarter. Yeah. He finally came out and, yes. <laughs> and got down on one knee in front of me. There's 20 or 30 people, all the cast, everybody there laughing. He got down on one knee. I wish I had a photograph of this. <laughs> and ha and ha offered me a silver dollar. Much bigger than a quarter. I mean, I'm sorry, a half dollar, silver half dollar. I've never seen one. 
I don't think. I thought it was funny money. I wouldn't take it. <laughs> Hammer my quarter. And the people are really after him. Now, Donnie, on, on one knee, on, oh, God, I wish I had a film with it. He said, Donnie, please take this. This is real money. And finally, somebody said, Donnie, it's okay. It's real money. <laughs> please, please take this. It's real money. Yeah. So he, he was a perfect example. And the rest of his life, look at the rest of his life. Huh? He never um, uh, got involved in some of the things that other people do. Uh, he was very respected. My father told me later. That he saw him, he thinks he saw him, a volunteer at a Salvation Army on a Saturday. Okay. Um, and probably most folks, not in a costume now. Yeah, yeah. Had no clue who he was. He didn't care. That kind of non pretentious, genuine American man. And that was my young standard as a kid. That is uh, pretty good. Sarah, thank you. That was a wonderful question to start us off with. I think I have time for one or two more. What do we have next? Here's one from Brian. Ooh, Brian would like to know what is your favorite Disney movie? Shall I start? If you like, go ahead. All right. My favorite Disney movie is Mary Poppins with Billy Andrews. I see it again. I just saw it last week with my new hubby. And we sat there and I found new things in it that I had not seen before. My second favorite, and they're very, very close, of course, is a thing called Peter Pan. I think it's a going film. I think it'll make it. I really, really do. Uh, well, uh, anything with Hans Conrad is fine by me. And the third one, believe it or not, is Pinocchio. Oh. I just think the animation in Pinocchio was astounding. At, at the, at the wall with the clocks, I will never forget how the yeah. animators did all of those clocks on his wall. So those are my three favorites. I think those are very fine choices. Uh, how about you, Donnie? I must say Peter Pan as well, only because I paid myself with my own money eh, to see it more than once. That's my true teller. But even if I wasn't related to Bambi, if I'd just been washing windows in the studio, if I wasn't related to Bambi, I, I have an affection for Bambi because it has allowed me, once they discovered I was uh, still alive about 15 years ago, otherwise I never talked about those movies. Never. Okay? Anyway, in Marine Corps, 25 years, nobody knew nothing. Okay? But once I relaxed about being in the films and not being some boasting person, okay, I've been able to use, use Bambi for more good than I could ever do in uniform, out of uniform, running a business in the White House with President Ford, it would not make Bambi allowed me, sir and lady, to help orphans, to help children get back to their homework, um, to raise money for for uh, little uh, community parks. Uh, I could be a I could be a double jerk, and get on stage someplace and say, "Hey, we need to raise money for this community park." Bambi said so, and it works. <laughs> So, Bambi's my favorite because it's done so darn much good for so many people. I, I may, like may I add something to Peter Pan? Uh, when it had its 50th anniversary, I was lucky enough to be asked to go to London for a big press junket. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was over there, I thought, well, uh, they opened up a theater that uh, was sort of a historical theater and they were going to show Peter Pan. Now there's 50 years from the time that it had opened. And they, I looked out at the audience and they had all of these little children, maybe three, four years of old. And I thought, well, they're not going to really have fun with Peter Pan. I did not realize it until that moment how funny the movie is. Huh. The that just rang out in that theater. And the kids were dancing around and doing all the things with it. And since then, I've asked other people, of course, I, um, you know, I, I lost my husband uh, 21 years ago, uh, my second husband, and I took him to see Peter Pan. He had never seen it. And we were in a big theater and I'm telling him all about Peter Pan and he's chuckling away and loving it. And I said, and when we did this and so on, he leaned over and he said, Margaret, I'd recognize those thighs any place. <laughs> so there's just so much. Love. 
but it is the happiest. People have to laugh and have such a good time in it. And that makes a difference because it could, Disney could have made the film so dark, yeah. but it wasn't. It was a happy, happy time. Thank you for so I could add that. Well, absolutely. And Brian, thank you. That was a wonderful question. Uh, what do we have next? Uh, this is from Cole, who wants to know, how fun was it to work at the Disney Studios? <laughs> <I don't, laughs> this is the first film animated or any, first animated of any of the industries in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, New York, where the producer and the directors use real children for the voices of children in the animation, as opposed to adults pretending to be children, right? Yeah. For many, many weeks initially, um, only a couple of days a week, half day at the studio. Uh, first doing the, the, the uh, facials, look left, look right, look afraid, okay, for the artist. Okay? <clears throat> I was the only child. I went through some offices sometimes where I don't think they had seen a child since birth. I mean, I was the only child around, around there. Okay? Excuse me. And uh, <clears throat> one day, hey, uh, in the hallway again, the right hallway, um, I had to, I bought a gun in my little bag that Boris Kolev had given me for Christmas a year and a half before, or two years before. And I wasn't supposed to have it. I told sooner or later, don't do this. No, I was wrong, don't do this. But I had my water gun with me in my little bag with a little, a little book. And here down the hallway comes a man, the only man in Disney at the time, I think, that was a grouch. I mean, he was an absolute certified grouch, okay? And I learned later he was in the numbers business, accounting business or something. Hmm. And he's coming down the hallway with all these papers in his hand and he ran, 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 griping about something. You know? And the hallway is big. And I'm a little run guy yet, too, right? And uh, I'm, I'm close to him. He says, Look out, kid. Mm. Hey. <clears throat> and he stops to adjust his papers. I, around the corner of the hallway intersection, I got my little water gun out. Now, kids don't do this, but he's going to be honest with you. Got my water gun out. Pew, pew, two great shots in my, in my apprenticeship in the Marine Corps. Two great shots right back here. Bang, bang. He looks up. He's waiting and the leaking. The roof is leaking again. It's sunshine outside, right? Remember typewriters? Lots of them in the hallway. The doors open. All the typewriters stopped. <laughs> when they came out to look what? So he's raising the neck and got water coming down his neck and he's looking around. He dropped his papers on the floor. I got him. I'm still hiding in the corner. Now here comes a guy right behind me in a three piece suit. He, I mean, it looks like the prime minister, right? Yeah. <laughs> Big guy. Right? And he looks down at me and gives me one of the mother superior deals. Remember this? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I got, Talk about the, I, uh, the evidence. I got the dripping gun in my hand. <laughs> he looks around the corner and sees who this was. He must have realized this guy was a jerk too or something. He looked back at me, smiled, and gave me one of these deals. Get going, get going. <laughs> I took a football player later. Now I'm an apprentice fullback. I went through offices, hadn't seen child ever. <laughs> got back to where my mom was. Had my gun put away. Okay? About 15 and 20 minutes later, here comes security man. Now, not like the day of all the apparatus and the martial stuff. And he right. had no gun and no weapon and nice man. He was security. And he came up and my mom was distracted. Thank goodness, because I didn't cheat know about this, you know. <laughs> he came up, he said, Johnny, I need your gun. <laughs> my mom didn't be there. I got to do this before she goes back, right? So I took it out of class and told him, I said, well, this ain't Hillary. I said, Boris, Frankenstein, Boris gave me the I didn't cut no ice, right? He took it anyway, right? Now, go uh, decades for, past now, uh, forward, I should say, uh, 15, 14 years ago, when they discovered I'm still breathing, hey, and uh, they invited us to Disney from here, Wonderful host people, the wonderful visit we had. Our very first visit back after all these years. Now I'm in, in the executive dining room of my wife and 
um, and some wonderful people. And over on the side is the board of directors, and they picked this up and introduced us to the board. Okay, they're, they're eating, right? I'm standing there, and a couple of us. One of the board members on, I love this one. He said very nice. He said, "Gosh, what a what an experience! Is there anything that, that we can do for you?" I want my gun back. Close. <laughs> you know what? You, know, you guys have got my water gun. I want my gun there. Because they took it down and put it in some security place. And, you know, I want it back. <laughs> yeah. I still don't have it back. And about once a year, I let somebody just you know, where's my gun? <laughs> <laughs> where's my Boris Karloff Frankenstein water pistol? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to answer that question in a little different way. <clears throat> like like um, uh, uh, kids who worked in the in this industry from the time they were four, and it was a new industry to all of us. Of course, we were feeling our way too. My mother taught me that the head of a studio was also God, G-A-W-D, she pronounced it. Um, <laughs> If you ever caught sight of the head of the studio, be sure and curtsy and, and avert your eyes because you're not to look at this person. They are so above everyone else. And that's what you were trained and taught to do. Yeah. So, uh, in, and, and Columbia Studios was really rough place to work. Paramount was a little bit better. RKO was a little bit better than everything else. MGM was much too large. Uh, 20th Century Fox, you could get lost in it in five minutes walking on a lot. And there wasn't anyone to help you. And so here I am at Disney Studios. And of course, I started working in uh, TV just about this time. So I was sort of used to this. And it's a very small studio. Uh, in, in the acreage and everything that they had. As a matter of fact, they only had one sound stage when I was working there. So uh, I, I'm thinking, well, I've been trained that I will curtsy. I'm ready if a head of the studio comes by. Well, we were in working with Mark Davis and Jerry Geronimi and the, and the 35 millimeter camera and all the lighting and so on. And I was doing my Tinkerbell thing out in the middle of the floor and they were figuring out what to do. And I saw a group of people come in uh, over at, at the slide. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the first one was Buddy Ebsen. You could tell by his walk. There was just no question. Yeah. And it was a group that went over, and they were trying to figure out registration. And he was working with this group of men. Of course, I had no dialogue, so it didn't have to be quiet like that. After they left, this man broke away from the group and came over to see Mark Davis and Jerry Geronimi. And I was introduced to him and the cameraman, and it was Walt Disney. Well, I was stunned. It was the head of the studio. I mean, I didn't know what to say. I really didn't. I stood there like a schoolgirl, and he was very kind and very nice. And it happened again a little bit, a uh, couple of weeks later, and over he came. And somebody had told him that I had mentioned I went to school with both of his daughters, Monticello School for Girls, Sharon and Diane. Oh, wow. And sure enough, he looked up at me and he says, I understand you went to school with my daughters. I mean, I was, I mean, the head of the studio knew this. It was just yeah. funny. Hmm. As we shook hands and we chatted, and I didn't say very much, believe me, because I was trained. And the third time he came over, suddenly it dawned on me this was not only the head of the studio, this was Walt Disney. <laughs> three times because you were trained in a certain way well he couldn't have been nicer very handsome then very trim beautifully dressed i never saw him smoke he was charming he had a lovely low voice and uh i couldn't have been happier but that was the difference between the studios to work mm -hmm. Disney was a place that you really wanted to go and work and I, I said, I dropped everything and took a day off at Paramount to uh, uh, 20th Century to get over there. Yeah. Yeah. And here's, uh, here's, yeah, here's you in action. <laughs> there are, oh, there were with some of the props. Yeah. Trying to get off. You know, they had to, to uh, two men, one in front and one in back, had to wind me in to that keyhole because I couldn't get in or out by myself. And they thought they would 
pull a joke on me and leave me there, say, we're going to go to lunch. We'll see you later. Of course, they wouldn't. They, wouldn't. they were just absolutely charming. Oh, that is wonderful. Oh, and I, okay, Cole, thank you so much. That was a fabulous question. And GalaxyCon viewers, I'm afraid this has been my time with these Disney Paragons. Donnie, uh, Margaret, any final words for our audience before we leave tonight? Well, with me, there's no question about it. It's blessings and faith and trust and a whole bunch of pixie dust. Have a merry, merry holiday. Oh, and the fact that so many wonderful people are in love with those classic films says a lot about our character today, as opposed to some of the boom, boom, bang, bang, bang stuff going on. And you hear, I hear that from children, hear from grandmothers. Um, I hear from old sergeants in the Marine Corps say, one of them said, sure, we just found out you were Bambi. We found out about Frankenstein. And we can handle the Bambi, but we called you worse than Frankenstein a couple of times. <laughs> you know, people who still love these things tells us a great deal about the American character. Absolutely. Uh, Donnie Margaret, it's been my absolute pleasure to serve you both today. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. And thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. And thank you for all your great questions. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. And please keep washing those hands. Donnie and Margaret, just stick around. We're going to go backstage. Thank you.